continue worship in this season of Advent, a season of busyness, of preparation, but we prepare with, uh, not with angst, but with anticipation and excitement as we work towards and anticipate to God's word becoming flesh among us in the birth and life of Jesus. And so as we continue into this season of anticipation, a couple of announcements um, and ways that we can respond to God's grace, ways we can serve, ways we can grow uh, in faith. Um, and if you guys can bring the mic down, I know Tom's going to have an announcement in a second. So while the mic is making its way down, um, this coming uh, today, uh, during faith formation or Sunday school time, right after the service, grab a cup of coffee at Holy Grounds, and then the adult, um, the faith formation class that has been watching the movie, today they're going to um, spend some time in learning and talking about Lutheran humor. Now, Pete told me something about, and there's a giveaway for a million dollars. I guess he found a secret compartment in the budget or something, but there may be a million dollars. We certainly know there'll be laughs as you talk about Lutheran humor and right next door to Holy Grounds in your coffee or tea for the morning as well. Morning, Tom. Good morning. We have two retirees events this week. On Wednesday uh, at noon, the retirees are gathering for their Christmas party. Uh, Dickies from Springboro is going to provide, uh, or we're buying, uh, barbecue, and there'll be a $5 gift exchange, and that'll be noon on Wednesday. And there's something else about that that I don't remember. Uh, and then Thursday, we start the retirees' Bible study with Pastor Steve, and that'll be 11.30 brown bag, 12 o'clock discussion on the book of Jonah. Thank you very much. Thanks, Tom. Yeah. Uh, great, great opportunity, you know, as we have vibrant uh, retiree ministry that isn't just like faith uh, stops when you retire, but it is a lifelong process. So how great we have the Bible study starting back up, Christmas celebration, all sorts of things, ways you can continue to grow in faith even if you're living that great retired life that one day I long for. <laughs> Uh, any other announcements for the sake of community this morning? I remembered the third thing, and that is, if you're coming on Wednesday, please sign up in the narthex. Thank you. I think we're good. Okay. Uh, and also, you've, uh, we continue, finally, we took a break last week. Um, but this week of the return, our third of our final temple talks uh, is from one amongst you will share their story of faith on how they uh, made that decision way back when to join in on Zion's work and to be a part of Zion. And also then they'll all invite us and encourage us to continue to join in on this next chapter as we continue uh, soon start to wrap up this fall stewardship campaign, which we're calling Join Us. Uh, as a reminder, is joining in on not just a financial piece, that is a piece of it this fall. We'll talk about more uh, in the spring and winter of other ways we can join in. But what a great time in the life of the church we call Zion. As you have concluded 200 years, we're on to the third century of ministry. And quite honestly, churches that are over 200 years old are not in a healthy place like Zion is. Uh, and it isn't just because I am here, although I'm glad most of you are still happy that I'm here. Uh, but if you look around, the excitement is because all of you sitting here, all of you sitting worshiping with us from home, uh, that God has done great things through and amongst all of us in the past 200 years, uh, and God will continue to do great things. And so we wanted to spend this fall with inviting everyone literally to join us on this next exciting chapter of what God is doing at Zion. And so we look forward later on and towards the end of the service hearing our next uh, temple talk just to get us all inspired on the home stretch of this fall stewardship campaign. If you still have questions about this stewardship campaign, uh, Ron will be available in the narthex or the gathering space. Grab a cup of coffee, come back uh, after the service for a simple uh, Q&A just so we're all on the same page and we understand what we're doing and what we're being asked of one another in this campaign. If there are no other announcements or questions for the sake of the community, let us focus our hearts and our minds on worship as we gather as God's people, one beloved community in a variety of places. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Amen. So as we continue this season of Advent, a time uh, daily in our lives where the darkness seems to be creeping in, we increase lighting the candles around the Advent wreath as a protest not only to the darkness, but to continue to be committed to the light as Jesus comes to be among us. 
We hear it from the Gospel of John. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word became flesh, and in him was life, and the life was the light of all people. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. This season, we are reminded that Christ has already come among us, and we anticipate his return, when our despair will be transformed and our path is illuminated by the peace that Jesus brings. So as we light this second candle, we give thanks for the peace that Christ brings. Yet our peace is not only far off, an eventual reality. Jesus has begun God's work. He is doing it, and one day will return to that good work. A day when hatred is transformed into peace. A day when war is transformed into peace. A day when our divisions is transformed into peace. Come, Lord Jesus, illuminate our way with your peace. As you're able, we invite to stand as we sing our gathering hymn. of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and unity of the Holy Spirit be with you all.
Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Let us pray together. Stir up our hearts, living God, to prepare the way of your only Son. By his coming, give to all the people of the world knowledge of your salvation. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The first reading is from Malachi chapter 3. See, I am sending my messenger to prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. The messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, indeed, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming, and who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver, and he will purify the descendants of Levi and refine them like gold and silver until they present offerings to the Lord in righteousness. Then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasing to the Lord as in the days of old and as in former years. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Our psalm is from Luke chapter 1. Blessed are you, Lord, the God of Israel. You have come to your people and set them free. You have raised up for us a mighty Savior, born in the house of your servant David. Through your holy prophets, you promised of old to save us from our enemies, from the hands of all who hate us. Show your mercy to our forebears, and to remember your holy covenant. This was the oath you swore to our father Abraham, to set us free from the hands of our enemies. And you, child, shall be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare the way. In the tender compassion of our God, the dawn from on high shall break upon us. The second reading is from Philippians chapter 1. I thank my God every time I remember you, constantly praying with joy in every one of my prayers for all of you, because of your sharing in the gospel from the first day until now. I am confident of this, that the one who began a good work among you will bring it to completion by the day of Jesus Christ. It is right for me to think this way about all of you, because you hold me in your heart, for all of you share in God's grace with me, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness, how I long for all of you with the compassion of Christ Jesus. And this is my prayer, that your love may overflow more and more with knowledge and full insight to help you to determine what is best so that in the day of Christ you may be pure and blameless. Having produced the harvest of righteousness, that comes through Jesus Christ for the glory and praise of God. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. to St. Luke, chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. Glory to you, Lord. In the 15th year of the reign of Emperor Tiberius, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, and Herod was ruler of Galilee, and his brother Philip, ruler of the region of Iteria and Trachonitis, and Licinius, ruler of Abilene, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. He went into all the region around the Jordan, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. As it is written in the book of the words of the prophet Isaiah, the voice of one crying out into the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. 
Every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough rays made smooth, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. May be seated. So if you've been watching um, our online, uh, we've been showing what I call kind of a Sunday sneak peek. So each Wednesday, we've just been a short video message. Uh, and if you haven't seen them, you just go to a church's website and you can watch all the past ones. But in the past uh, week, we've been doing it on Wednesdays. And we say, okay, looking forward to this Sunday around our sermon series, Ugly Christmas Sweater. Here's kind of a teaser on what we're going to be talking about this coming Sunday. Uh, and so in that, if you watched it, I said this Sunday, so today... We're going to give three tips as we continue this second part of our series. Uh, and so we're going to do those later in a service. But if you're someone who likes to write things down, you just might want to have a pen close to your bulletin for later on in the sermon. So you'll get those three tips. Um, in our second service, that's when our youngest disciples, our children, um, are usually in that worship service. So I'll have a message for young disciples. Uh, and sometimes it is a time for me to talk with them. Uh, but often is a time that they get to stretch their legs and I'm just kind of talking to everyone. Um, and so, because we're all disciples, and a lot of times what I found out is our youngest disciples are bold enough to ask the questions that many of us all have, but as adults, we start to get a little quiet when our, when our questions, we don't ask them. So, in the spirit of this moment, if we had youth, would be a message for young disciples, but knowing we're all disciples, I'm going to do the exercise with all of us uh, that I'm going to do with everyone at the 11 o'clock service as well. Uh, and so, at our second service, the, the young disciples are actually going to have, like, big like whole piece of paper of a smiley face and a frown face uh, for what we're going to do. But you don't need to do that. In this case, I'm going to give you a list of words. I'm going to say some words. And if you like the word that I say, you just say, woohoo. Let's try that. Okay? Okay. See, I thought this was fun because you're one of the most participatory congregations I've ever served. So I was looking forward to today. How many people can I make say woohoo in worship? So if you hear a word that I like, you say woohoo. And it doesn't have to be loud, but like... I need a little boo if it's something you don't like. Okay, well, I think we got that one good. Okay, and you're not all going to say woohoo, or you're not all going to say boo at the same time. There may be both, okay? So if I hear a word, just woohoo or boo, depending on how you feel. Christmas cookies. Woo-hoo. Okay, got some mouths. Uh, anchovies. Boo. Okay. Um, warm homemade bread. Woo-hoo. Eight minute sermons. <laughs> Taxes. Boo. Speeding tickets. Boo. <laughs> Vacation on the beach or the mountain. Boo. Right. So just simple words. That's a simple exercise on how words have an impact in our lives, right? They even stirred up, maybe now you're already thinking, gosh, I really wish these cold months that we were on the beach. Or man, I hope I never have to have anchovies because you were traumatized by that experience when you were seven years old. You know, all these words have a way of stirring up our thoughts, our emotions. The words have power. Last week in our beginning of this series, Ugly Christmas Sweater, we talked about the impact, uh, the power of what we call ugly thoughts. And really the whole reason that we're doing this series. You know, some people may say, why do this series, you know, Ugly Christmas Sweater? It kind of started off in two ways. One, I just kind of saw it in my preparations for the season. Uh, and I thought it looked a little fun, right? A little silly, but there's some substance to it. But I thought, you know, we need something a little lighthearted because life is still tough. It's getting darker outside and life is still challenging. And so let's do a little something a little fun. Uh, and let's encourage people to wear their ugly or beautiful Christmas sweaters uh, in December. Uh, but especially wear yours on December 19th. We'll talk about that later. We did the Ugly Christmas Sweater series as part just a lighthearted series to have in the season of Advent because life is still difficult. Uh, but also, it is a substance, uh, substance to it, because as much as this time of year stirs up in us excitement to those woohoo moments, we know it stirs up the ugly side in us, uh, of us in times, right? Those increased demands, those increased responsibilities, those to-do lists seem a little longer, and it's colder and darker, so it's harder to get that list done. All the pressures in on us sometimes stir up in us. What we talked about last week, those ugly thoughts. And last week, we talked about how the thoughts just have... Um, Our brain's almost like hardwired that negative thoughts um, impacts us more widely uh, and more often than positive feedback. And so we talked about last week how then what would it look like for us instead of being um, people responding to 
through our ugly thoughts if we were messengers of hope, if we acted with hope, which is, you know, expecting that Jesus will come, that will restore those challenging parts in our lives. And so that brings us to week number two, ugly words. And just this exercise of woos and boos this morning show us that words have an impact in our lives. Even as simple as taxes and anchovies, vacation and homemade bread, just those simple words can stir up thoughts and emotions in us. Now we've all been in a, uh, had that experience of something much more serious. You know, how many of us have said something this time of year, you know, you're around a table, and even though your family member will say, hey, don't talk about religion or politics or football or whatever list of things your family doesn't ever want to talk about because we wanted to have a peace-filled, joy-filled Christmas dinner, but inevitably, we've all been in those conversations, and it's not just limited to the holidays, you know, where you've been in a conversation with someone across a table, and, you know, you're trying to listen to, like, this other side conversation, and maybe somebody's making this little noise with their fork in this plate, and it's annoying you because you're trying to listen to this person, and you know you have opposing um, different views, and so you're listening, and you feel like you're not being heard, you're being sidetracked by this conversation, you're being annoyed by the sound at the other end of the table, and then suddenly maybe you just say something um, that, well, maybe if you just had your life together, you know, you wouldn't have such a difficulty dating, or maybe if you did this, you wouldn't lose your, you know, we've all done things where we said something, and like that tube of toothpaste, you can't put it back in. Once it's out there, it's out there. And then in seeing, when we've said those words, sometimes you say it and it's like coming out and you can't stop yourself and you want to grab it halfway out there when it's lingering across the table, but it's too late. You've already seen the, the facial expression of the person change and they droop and they shut down from the conversation. Maybe they even leave the room. Or maybe, you know, it's made for TV kind of stuff and they just, you know, throw their napkin. I don't need to take this. This is why I don't come to holiday dinners anymore. And they leave. And suddenly you've realized not only once those words are out, can you not take them back, but then the impact of our words. Even as simple as single words, that exercise we did this morning, but even when we have said those things, when it's deep and profound or, or hurtful, and we know that not only can we not take them back, but they have a huge impact in the person who heard those words. Especially when we have been the, the person who has said the hurtful words, whether we intended to or not, Sometimes we intend to, I'm going to get that jab. I'm going to get them because we know what to say to push their buttons. Or sometimes we say something hurtful and we don't know about it. And we hear from someone else, oh, so-and-so was really hurt. Um, and you're like, well, I meant to say this, and they heard it as something else. And sometimes we have the opportunity to reconcile and to go and apologize and say, hey, you know, I was hungry. I was annoyed by this, you know, sidetracked here. I was annoyed by somebody, you know, Aunt Betty banging her spoon to her plate like she always does. And I was just, I was hungry, and I really wanted that homemade pie you make, and I was distracted. I'm sorry I shouldn't have said something what I did about your date life. Or... You know, you can talk to him, hey, let's have coffee. You know, I heard, you know, you misunderstood what we said, you know, when we had our conversation a week ago. But we know, unfortunately, words have power, but also we also don't always have that opportunity to go back and reconcile, to apologize, to clarify what we meant or to say, hey, here's where I was coming from. I wasn't in my best place when I made that comment to you. You know, I'm sorry that my words hurt you. Sometimes we can be thankful for those opportunities to reconcile what we have wronged through our words but not all the time. Sometimes we say something to the person in line at Kroger at the store, especially this time of year. You know, you think of the more places we're going to and the more people we're seeing that we may say something that may have an impact in a negative way and we aren't necessarily going to have a chance to heal that wrong or to reconcile things. But words have power. And this time of year, but not limited to the holidays, but especially this time of year when increased demands and increased opinions, kind of butting heads at times and increased stressors, all things demanding the attention of our brain. Sometimes what's on in our brain doesn't get filtered so well this time of year, and it comes on out, and once it's out, it has an impact. Just like in our readings today, the prophet, you know, we hear that Malachi, Micah is talking at a time that... Um, the temple had been rebuilt, but life was kind of still not so sure. Life felt a little normal at the temple, but things were still pretty chaotic. Things were still pretty divided. Things were tense. And he says, you know, I'll send a messenger to you that the words will be like that fuller soap, that refining fire. So we know words have a way of, of providing some clarity, some cleansing, and purifying things. Like a refiner's fire, a fuller soap, those are things that kind of purify and clean things that our words sometimes can be challenging, and sometimes our words even as challenging as they are, can bring that clarification, that purification, that clarity to what we're talking to. Or even maybe we've received words from someone else 
and they would speak a word of truth to us that maybe is that friend, you know, that says something difficult. We know we have that, you know, most people have that friend that they'll tell you how it is even if no one else will. And you'll come to them and say, hey, what do you think? I really messed up. What do you think I should have done? And they're like, yeah, you sounded like a real jerk to your cousin. Why did you do that? And they tell you that difficult truth, but then they say, hey, what if you go on and talk to them, invite them for coffee? They seem like a reasonable relative. And so kind of like the prophet this morning, you know, we're reminded of those messengers like that fuller soap, that refiner's fire that can be challenging but can help clarify the situation, help us restore that relationship we hurt with our words. Words are also powerful, like John the Baptist saying, you know, prepare the way I'm a voice crying out in the wilderness. When people heard John the Baptist's voice, they came from all over, uh, and what was uncommon in Jesus' time was they weren't meeting John in the center of town. That's where everything happened. They weren't even meeting John at the temple where everything happened in the markets. They met him on the fringe of town, out on the edge of the wilderness. The John's words were so powerful, they got people to change what they thought of as a normal place to meet people when something exciting was happening. When something exciting was happening, you meant a temple, you meant the center of town, you meant at the square where everything was happening. But John's words stirred up in people the action to do something different. And so the people would meet John the Baptist on the fringe of town, on the fringe of wilderness. So our words have an impact. We know sometimes they come out faster than we think. And once they're out there, they have that impact. And sometimes we can't always reconcile the difference. You know, when I was a social worker before I became a pastor, um, did that for about seven years and had um, some clients that, you know, they were helpful for whoever their case manager was. They were used to having different workers, and so they would work with the next person as easily as the person before me, and they're just cooperative. And you'd have some that were resistant to treatment in general, especially if it was court-ordered, which was a chunk of my caseload. And so they were not happy to be there to begin with, and they would often make it very clear they were not happy to be there. So any words I gave to them, any suggestions, any questions, any encouragement was often opposed pretty regularly. Except I have this one uh, client, and for an anonymity, we'll call him Charles today, um, and he was an active gang member. He was on um, supervision, so meant he was court ordered to come see me. He did not want to be there. He made it sure he did not want to be here. You all know me well enough now to know I am not a formidable figure. I do not step into a room and people are like, man, that's a big pastor. I'm not a big guy. Charles was a big guy. He probably had twice my size, maybe two and a half my weight. He was a big guy. Made it very clear, unhappy to be there. He didn't want to be there. But over time, through conversations, I was able to have that connection with him to where I was able actually to have uh, an influence and say, hey, Charles, what if you do this or that? Uh, what do you think about, here are your two choices. Which do you choose? And he was actually starting to make some progress in his treatment. Uh, even his probation officer was kind of acknowledging, hey, we might look on progressing things because he had started to um, participate so well because the power of our words, that conversation we were able to have. But then in a perfect example of it come, sounds really good in your mind, right? And it's not always about what's in our mind comes unfiltered out, but sometimes something sounds good in our mind and it doesn't sound so good when it's out here. It sounded really good up here, but when it's out there, you're like, that didn't come out how we thought it would. In one of those cases, I was working with Charles and um, we had an issue where he owed lots and lots of child support and he had a way to pay it, but he was not uh, by choice. And I said, hey, and this is going to sound odd, but in my field when I did social work, there was kind of some language that I would use with clients who um, were in gangs or in the uh, uh, correctional system that kind of was a way of relating to them was a little different than some of my other clients that I did more counseling with. And so I had a way of talking to Charles. It was a little different but worked for him, and I think those, some of those words are what ha helped him participate. But in a classic example of what's going on up here, it came out, and I couldn't take it back, but it had that damage. It said, Charles, let's talk about your child support because we don't want someone to misunderstand and think you're being a deadbeat dad. Over. He stood up in my office. I thought my office was going to be destroyed. He said a whole bunch of things, a whole bunch of words I'm not going to repeat in this place or ever, and then left. I said, well, man, I messed up there. And I even called him back a couple days later and said, hey, I misunderstand. Here's what I meant. He was done. He said, it was done. Even, and even after that, we had several months of uh, him coming in, and he couldn't just have a new caseworker because of his situation and non-participation in the past that... They're like, You're, we're not going to switch him around. He's, he's stuck with you whenever he comes in. And we even explain, hey, you know, I'm sorry. Hey, here's, here's what I meant to say. I was just trying to get you to think about this. I wasn't trying to offend you. You know, you participated well in treatment. You're making progress. He didn't want to hear it. Even though I even, with him, had the chance to say, hey, I'm sorry. I messed up. Here's where I was coming from. Here's what I was thinking about, even though it came out the wrong way. For him, the damage was done. 
So in this time of year, we think maybe of those relatives that it's difficult to have conversations with. And not even our relatives, because those are the people we have a chance to come back to and say, hey, I'm sorry, I messed up. But you know, you think of how we've ever maybe been short to someone in line like at Starbucks or a grocery store or any store we go to. Uh, maybe we're impatient and those words come out to the person that bumps into us in the cart. But when we think of our ugly words, how can that change? What not does it look like, but what does it sound like when we give ourselves a little bit of time? When we just pause before what is going on in here, or maybe in here, comes out into the form of our words. So if you have your pen and your bulletin, these are the three tips. Uh, as Lutherans, we're always tough about suggesting we do things because you know, we're saved by grace, not by works, not by what we do. But this, these three tips are not how to earn your way to salvation. That is the gift of grace. That is what Jesus does for us. But as often, grace is not cheap grace. So in a case of thinking, how do we talk to others? How do we talk to those uh, closest to us in a healthy way? But sometimes we can be more mindful of what we say. Like this past Sunday, I was preparing with Sharon Epp, our uh, Christian education um, director. She was kind of putting the lesson together for our young disciples. And we are talking about, you know, ugly words and right and wrong and what are good words, what are ugly words. But really, this isn't just about thinking that the words have come out, but what we're talking about today isn't just what we say, but our thoughtfulness before what we say comes out. So here are the three tips that ultimately I think it sometimes comes down to just giving ourselves a little bit of time. You know, sometimes they say just need to stop and breathe or just think before you speak, right? That's a classic thing. But sometimes this time of year and all the excitement and all the movements that we don't always do that thinking or that feeling before we speak, the words are out, words have an impact. So sometimes these will, be the, these will be the three tips on sometimes how we can just pause for a second before we say something to the worker at the store or to our relative across the table or beside us that keeps banging that spoon up against the plate. So our first tip is thinking, okay, if you're able in that moment to slow down and say, okay, I'm getting ready to say something, and part of this just means you're being more mindful. You're not only thinking about what you're saying, but thinking about what the other person is saying to you. So first thing is thinking, is what I'm going to say and this doesn't have to be speech. I forgot to insert. This can be like social media stuff. You know, maybe you've been, uh, I've been a victim where I've had a, a cousin say something to me, and their picture is there. I know it's them. It's not like this anonymous comment. And I know there's no way they would have said to me in person what they just said online. So this goes both ways. Before you go to type something or before you go to say something, uh, if you're able to pause, this first thing, first step, is what I'm going to say, whether it be online or verbally, going to honor God. Now, simply, Jesus will say in the Gospels to his disciples, he'll say, you, people will know you are my followers. We say, people will know we are Christians, not by our love of homemade bread or Christmas cookies or our dislike of anchovies and speeding tickets, but people will know we are Christians by our love. So think, is, is this what I'm going to say going to help point people to the love of God or not? Or really, is it going to point someone to the love of God or discourage them from the love of God, right? We've all heard people where they've said, well, you know, I knew so-and-so went to church, but then, you know, classic example, unfortunately, sometimes people go to worship, and I've had friends that were servers will say that sometimes the rudest guests at restaurants are Sunday mornings at brunch, and you knew them all, they all came to church because they had dresses and they had their church name tags on, and they're being the rudest people with their words. So just thinking, will our words honor God or pull people away from God? Secondly, is what we're going to say going to be something we'll regret? Is it going to be something that we're going to have to come back to and say, hey, I'm sorry, you know, I messed up, I shouldn't have said that, I was acting in the heat of the moment, or I was thinking about something else and not what you were saying, or I wasn't listening to you, I misheard you, or I overreacted, I was hungry, you know, I need to be fed when we have conversations, whatever it is. Is it what you're going to say something you have to regret or something you're going to have to respond to by working to reconcile the hurt you did with that person? And finally, this one kind of stuck out to me. This, this one stuck with me for uh, the most of this week. When we think about the third tip, things we can think of to be more thoughtful so that our words aren't those ugly words of hurt but become words of peace. This third tip is thinking, will what I'm going to say honor that person? Will it bring honor to the person you're talking to? I think there's like an eighth commandment in there. You know, you should honor, honor your neighbor. But you know, is what we're going to say honor that person, which I think kind of blew my mind because, if anything, I think of how um, in, in a society we're having conversations, uh, and I've been thinking about a lot of opposing views, especially in politics and other issues, that so often it's my opinion and someone else's opinion. Either we have to agree or if we disagree, we just have to be distant. 
You know, what would it look like in these different conversations around politics and other hot issues if we had a conversation saying, what am I going to say that's going to bring honor to someone with a different view or a different experience or a different insight? So is what we're going to say going to bring honor to the person checking us out at the store? Is it going to be bring honor to Cousin Ted who um, just does not have good, struggles to have good conversations, but is it going to bring honor to him? And what am I going to say going to bring honor to Aunt Betty who likes to tap her spoon along that plate? And that's really at the heart of what today is. We talk about Advent being a season where we anticipate Jesus is coming. And we do it with excitement because this week we focus on how Jesus will bring us peace. But peace isn't just let's agree to disagree. Peace isn't just let's just not talk about these difficult things because we know our words might cause harm. But peace in Jesus' time and peace in our time is more than just getting along. In Jesus' time when he talked about peace, it means shalom. That's actually the word he would have used would have been shalom. And the beginning root word of that actually is connected to a meaning for wholeness. So in the season of busyness, of preparation, it tends to sometimes bring out the ugly side of us if we're not paying attention. As we focus this week on being thoughtful and mindful of what we're saying, how it could bring honor to God, how it might put us in a place where we regret or we have to do work of reconciliation, or when we're able to think of how and what I say can bring honor to someone else, what might that sound like this week when we know that Jesus comes to bring us peace and not only a peace of calmness but of a whole wholeness that we anticipate Jesus' return because he will bring wholeness to us and all of creation. So this week as you're doing all the busyness, the preparing, how might those ugly words be transformed? Actually, what will it sound like when those ugly worded thoughts up here or here even come out rather as words of honor, of peace, and wholeness for the person we're going to speak to. What might that sound like this week? Amen. you're able, invite to stand as together we proclaim the faith which unites us in the words of the Apostles' Creed. Let us state our faith together. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit 
and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He ascended to God. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, the life everlasting. You're invited to be seated or kneel and kneelers in front of you as we pray for the church, the world, those close to us, and those we have yet to meet. In the season of watching and waiting, let us pray for all people in places that yearn for God's presence. Good and gracious God, we come to you today, continuing to prepare our hearts and our lives for this season in anticipation of your coming to be amongst us again through the birth of your son, Jesus. In the busyness that is this season, in our thoughts and in our words, we lift up to you, using our words as ways of healing, lift up to you these prayers of those close to us, those we have yet to meet, all of your beloved children, around all of your creation in need of healing and peace. We lift up to you and pray for today. And God, we know you send messengers into the world to proclaim the day of your coming. Make our bishops, pastors, deacons, lay preachers, council leaders, and volunteers confident in their preaching and speaking that their words and our lives give witness to your grace. Hear us, O oh God. God, we ask you send your spirit to all living creatures that are endangered. Provide them with shelter and care and bring us into the right restored relationship with the earth that you created and called good. Hear us, O oh God. Loving God, we ask that you send your peace and healing for those who grieve. Specifically, we pray today for the communities in Oxford, Michigan, for the families who grieve of Tate Meyer, Madison Baldwin, Hannah St. Julia, and those who are recovering from injuries, and the many students, staff, faculty who endure struggles and PTSD of the trauma. Bring their families healing and peace in their time of angst and anguish, we also pray that you continue to bring wholeness to the hearts of those who feel the best response is retaliation and violence. Hear us, O oh God. O oh God, we ask you send your servants to care for those who suffer. Use our ministries and our lives to reach out with compassion to those who are hungry, oppressed, lonely, or ill. Grant them healing and wholeness. And God, we lift up to you today prayers of our own hearts, those in need of healing by name. Pray for Jared, for Rita, and their families. Hear us, O oh God. God, you send prophets to speak difficult truths, even when they're poorly received. Embolden those who ask hard questions and challenge accepted ways. Instill in youth and elders alike a passion for pointing to Jesus in all things. Hear us, O oh God. Mercy is great. Loving God, we also lift up to you now prayers of our own hearts, silently are spoken.
God, as we lift up to you those prayers of our hearts and in our lives, we also thank you for those among us, the continued ministry in their lives and the impact they've had within and beyond these walls. So we thank you for Aubrey, for Tim, and Lynn, who will soon celebrate birthdays. Thank you for the blessing they are to so many. Continue to be with them and those we lift up to you by prayer today. Hear us, O God. The mercy is great. Providing God, we thank you for the ongoing work of those among us here at Zion. Specifically this week, we thank you for the ministry of the operations and fellowship teams. Continue to strengthen their ministry of care for our facility and for our community. Loving God, we lift up to you all these prayers, trusting you come again to bring us restoration and peace, peace and wholeness. Pray for wholeness for all those we pray. In the name of the one who came so that we could be made whole, Jesus Christ, in his name we pray, amen. Now let's respond to God's grace and generosity as we gather our offerings and our tithes.
Let us pray. God of our reigning and watching, we offer the gifts of our hearts and our lives in the service of all your people. Prepare the way before us as we meet you in this simple meal. Through Christ Jesus, our pathway and our peace. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. Indeed, right, our calling and our joy, that we should at all times and all places give thanks and praise to Almighty God. For your very word is what creation waited for, being formed out of chaos. It's that same word that the people of Israel awaited to give them peace and freedom from slavery and wandering. It's that same word that became flesh in the life, ministry, death, and resurrection of Jesus, bringing your word, flesh, walk among us. Is that same word today through your Holy Spirit brings us peace and wholeness in our actions, our thoughts, and our speech. And so we join all of those gathered in a variety of places in worship today in praising your name and singing their song without end. We gather as God's people awaiting Jesus' return to be among us. We gather around God's table to be reminded how God is revealed in this meal, this bread, this cup, Jesus' very presence. We remember that night in which he was betrayed, and also through the power of the resurrection, this has become a meal of hope for us. So remember that night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. After giving thanks, he broke it, gave it to them, said, take and eat, all of you. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. In the same way, after the meal, when Jesus had given thanks, he took the cup, gave it to them, and said, Take and drink, all of you. This cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people, for the forgiveness of sins, as often as you drink from it do, for the remembrance of me. Trusting in the holy mystery and gift that Jesus is present in, with, and through this meal, let us pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Certainly, if you're a guest worshiping with us today, not only are we thankful for your presence, but we want you to know that you are welcome at God's table all are welcome at God's table. Or God sends no one away hungry. All are welcome to be fed with the gifts of God. So the way we do that here at Zion is at the instruction of the usher. Come down to the center aisle, receive a piece of bread, and then move on to the individual tray of either a glass of red wine or non-alcohol um, juice in the middle. Also have gluten-free bread. And then you can dispose, dispose of your cups in the side basket as you return down the side aisle. But no, all are welcome at God's table. There's more than enough for everyone. Amen. Maybe see it.
please stand as you're able. I'll be reminded these gifts are the body, blood, and blessing of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. God's gifts to strengthen and keep you now and forever. Amen. Let us pray. Most high God, you have come among us at this table. By the Spirit's power, form us to be bearers of your word, sharing gifts of mercy and grace with all. Through Jesus, our first and our test. Amen. May be seated as uh, the Armstrong family is coming up to the, uh, to the pulpit, to the microphone. Uh, this is our third final temple talk. Um, and I'm, I'm excited. Um, I wanted to tell everyone in these uh, three weeks that I knew we had such great people giving great witness to their story that I didn't want to do sermons. They wouldn't let me do that. Um, but really, as we're talking about join us, the excitement of the church, the church Zion is where it is because of all of you and people that have gone before us. Uh, the hope of the church is all of you. And of course, eventually those who will be added to that. Uh, but we thought what a great way to be reminded of um, how people have connected and of course their invitation on uh, what we're joining in on, because you've had a pastoral transition, you've had a pandemic, uh, and we're still in a place where we can have hope and positivity and a bright future, thanks to God's work and all of your faithfulness. So look forward to the Armstrong's family, as they are the third of our final uh, Temple Talk, inviting us to join in on what God is doing here at Zion. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. We were, invite, uh, we were asked by the stewardship committee to come and talk about our journey to Zion. Our journey started in the summer of 1971. We were planning our wedding and was looking for a Lutheran church close to our families. We were told about Zion on Munger Road and Alex Bell. We get, drove over here one day and uh, looked the church over. Uh, then we called Zion uh, to get an appointment with Pastor Mullen to talk about our wedding plans. We were uh, planning on getting married on August 7th of 1971. Judy's home church was in Norwood. She, her and her family went to the Lutheran church down there. Pastor Redder was their pastor. So uh, Pastor Mullen's uh, call Pastor Redder and invite him to come up and be a co-pastor at our wedding. After we got married here, we alternated uh, on Sundays between coming here to Zion and going down to her church on uh, Norwood. We did that for several months. And uh, being coming here at Zion, we met quite a few uh, members here, got to know them pretty well. Uh, the church was very friendly to us and kind of embraced us while we were coming here. I remember one family inviting, inviting us to go to uh, Sunday school with them here, which we still do now. We go as often as we can to Sunday school. Um, when we uh, finally decided uh, that uh, Zion was a good fit for us, uh, we told Pastor Mullen we'd like to become members here. Uh, at the time, I was not going to any churches, and I had never been baptized. So the day came when we uh, became members. Uh, he also baptized me, which was one of the best days of my life. Um, after, uh, after being here for a couple of years, I was approached by uh, someone about being on church council. 
I was a little hesitant about doing that since I'd never been a member of a church before. But uh, I said, yes, I would do it. We were both in our 20s at the time, so we were still pretty young. Um, but I, I served on the council for two years. After that, uh, after that, later on, we were asked to be advisors for the Luther League, which they had a junior and a senior Luther League at that time. And uh, we really enjoyed working with the youth. We did a lot of activities with them and uh, enjoyed doing that. Uh, we've been greeters and uh, ushers for several years. Uh, I joined the men's group. Uh, we meet once a month. We have a Bible study, and then we have a planning session for any work that needs to be done around the church, in or outside of the church. Uh, I also mow grass uh, once a month. Uh, I will conclude with saying after being married here 50 years ago, and being a member for probably about 49 of those years, uh, I believe we made the right choice uh, making Zion our home church. We think Zion is still a friendly and embracing church. So I'm going to turn it over to Judy and I'll let her speak. Zion is my church, and you are all my church family. Having fellowship and chatting with everyone is a big part of my faith journey. I was baptized and raised in the Lutheran Church, as Larry said, in Norwood. So my faith and church has always been with me. It's a very simple faith story. Sorry I don't have a more dramatic story like Saul and Paul and a lightning bolt to tell you about. So when I joined Zion, it was important to me to find a church with three qualities I was looking for. A church that preached the gospel, was welcoming, and that reached out to the community. And I found that here at Zion. So I got excited and wanted to plug in and serve in the many opportunities that Zion had to offer. So I joined the handbell choir Help prepare food for the funeral. Help prepare food uh, for funeral lunches. Worked on the in the community garden. Served on the call committee and found a wonderful pastor. And attend Sunday school to continue my spiritual growth. <clears throat> Excuse me. I have to say, when I see so many churches closing, how blessed we are to have such faithful members and givers to keep, me, to keep more moving through our retirement and a temporary shutdown, we are still stronger than ever. I love Zion for the beautiful worship environment, for a talented music director, and beautiful music. For all the people here that fill up the church, that. Um, and that we serve and meet the community where they are at and meet their needs. As a congregation, we are so blessed by God and his accomplishments here. And, for your, and with your help of giving and serving, we can reach another 200 years. Pastor told me to not to talk too long but he would start the music rolling. <laughs> but I have a short story I'd like to share with you. Um, this goes back, probably started about nine years ago. Church had just let out. I was working my way down the pew, and I noticed an individual that was very upset, and she was crying. And she was working her way through the, through the back, that doorway back there to the hall. Before we remodeled, that used to be an exit way back there. So I got concerned and followed her out to the hallway. We were the only two back there. So I put my arm around her and um, we prayed. And she told me that uh, she was having a serious operation coming up and she was she was scared. 
So we prayed again, and I told her that I would be praying for her, and she said thank you. So I could tell in her eyes that they looked a little brighter. So we parted our ways. Now, I remember that moment, but I had completely forgot about it after so many years, until two weeks ago, I was leaving church, and she approached me, the same person approached me, and said, you know, I've never forgotten about the time that you came to meet me, and she motioned back in the hallway. She said, that meant more to me than you'll ever know. And then we, I said, thank you, and then I'll be praying for you again. I lost my train of thought here. And an update on that story. Um, she had surgery again this past week, and all went well, and she is at home recuperating. So why did I want to tell you this story? To listen to that still, small voice inside of you. And go. Go and leave your comfort zone and put your arm around that person that you might see hurting. Because years later, you might find out just what that meant to that person. Now what a inspirational example of just how words can have an impact long after they're even spoken. And so you know, I've told uh, people in this stewardship campaign in my time getting settled in as your still kind of new pastor that one of the biggest uh, impacts is when I looked at your uh, paperwork and it said, you know, our church has been around for 200 years and some churches put a period and Zion put a comma and somebody said it has a typo and I said, no, but you put the comma and they said, and is an opportunity for us to look forward to where we're headed the next 200 years. You know, how great of a story that uh, Judy was a comma to someone else. They could have had a period and they could have just left the door. Uh, but, you know, you, you were able to, to speak words of, of peace and, and comfort to them and it has, still has an impact to them many years later. Uh, and so that's just an opportunity we're inviting you all to join us uh, in this next chapter of Zion. That, that God is doing a new thing here, a great thing here. God has continued to work here. Uh, so we're inviting you to be a part of that. Uh, so again, if you have questions on some of the logistics in terms of the stewardship part, uh, Ron will be meeting after you grab your coffee, Holy Grounds. Uh, he'll be meeting right here out in the gathering space in Narthex to answer questions. Uh, the next Sunday, December 12th, at both services will be our Commitment Sunday. Uh, so we ask you to prayerfully uh, just think about your contribution uh, on the financial piece, uh, joining in on this next chapter. And then December 19th, uh, we'll have one blended service. And we know that comes with mixed responses, having a blended service. Uh, but on the 19th, I encourage you to attend that service because we're blending on having one worship service at 10, uh, not because we need to, but because we get to. It's an opportunity for us to come together uh, to celebrate our initial uh, responses of everyone's response uh, to their contributions, their commitments. Uh, we'll have one service at 10 o'clock. Invite you to bring your beautiful or ugly Christmas sweaters on December 19th. Uh, because we will all, we all have one too, will be in a sermon illustration. So on the 19th, so next Sunday, the 12th, is Commitment Sunday, so bring your cards uh, if you have them. We have some on our welcome table, which is between these two doors, or if you go hard left under the Zion pictures at our service table, uh, all the stewardship stuff is there as well. So next Sunday is Commitment Sunday, the 19th is one service at 10 o'clock, um, and then a meal of celebration afterwards on the 19th. So as we continue to live into this future that God has called us to as a bright future because God continues to be with us, please stand as we uh, conclude our worship this morning with our blessing. So as you go from this time of worship and service to speak words of peace and wholeness to those around you, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord's face shine upon you and be gracious to you. Know that no matter where you are, even out in the hallway with someone else, God's looking upon you in favor, giving you peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. If you're able, join us in sing our sending hymn.
With God's help, we will welcome the stranger, grow in faith, serve with love. Thanks be to God.